morning. I'm uh, about to give a second live tour because the first one seems to have gone out to nobody. Um, so this is going to be, it's been pre-practiced so that could hopefully stand us in good stead. So uh, welcome to Blarney Castle and Gardens and uh, it's a little bit emptier than usual as you'll see when we're looking around. But um, I'm Adam, the head gardener, and uh, Paul, our social media manager, is, is filming us. So hopefully a few of you have hung on long enough, because uh, I don't know what happened the first time. But uh, anyway, look, we'll just repeat. So um, we are going to try and bring you a series of videos over the next few weeks, hopefully, to give you an idea of what's going on and what we have here in the grounds and gardens. There's over 70 acres of gardens within the estate and several hundred area, um, acres of woodland, forestry, lake and farmland, um, all of which are open and accessible to the public under, under normal circumstances. So over the next few weeks, we're gonna try and show you some different areas, different garden areas, and talk you through some of them, the development, the history, what's going on and uh, try and bring you that in your own, your own living room since you're unable to come to us. Um, so one of the first things I do want to do is show you a couple of the specimen trees close to the entrance. A lot of our visitors come in and um, they obviously, the, the main focus and what we're known for is the castle and the stone itself. And uh, many visitors leave with a different mindset than what they came in with because their first expectations are, are, are a small area and castle and, and what they find here is so much more and uh, what we've found over the, the last few years is that the reviews on TripAdvisor etc are becoming more about the gardens and the gardens and what else we can offer and there really is a, the whole day out here um, in addition to the, the castle and the stone itself so I'm going to try and uh, show you some of that. So behind me, just before we kind of start moving around, you see there's three large conifer trees. These are uh, Pseudosuga menziesii um, from North America. And um, they probably date back to the 1900s. And what we find is throughout our grounds and gardens, we have a collection of, of North American introduction trees from around 100 years ago, which form the real backbone and structure of the gardens and the arboretums and stand is in good stead now um, really but these trees were being brought in at the time as almost collector's items this was the new world the new species coming in and all of the estates around europe were in competition who could grow the best who could get the first and uh, it doesn't change to this day i'm a bit of a plant hunter and collector myself and we're still looking at that whole one-upmanship as to okay, if you got this can you grow this and swapping plants as well is a big thing between different estates and gardens and uh, something we all try to encourage. But a couple of the areas of the gardens feature a lot of new um, species that we've either collected ourselves in the wild or have been collected and passed to us by other botanic gardens. And that's something I also want to show you. So one of the, the real focal points at the moment though in the gardens is our Japanese cherry trees. And uh, this particular one is the showstopper at the entrance. So this is a uh, Prunus Shirote and your timing's perfect because today I'd say it's just about at its peak for flower and you can see it's glorious, absolutely covered. And we're lucky in that this is right inside our main entrance. So it's, it's certainly one of the best entrance trees in Ireland and we find that a lot of the visitors coming in, they come in through the turnstiles and they stop and then the canvas come out. And it's the big wow factor is here. It's a great specimen in itself, even regardless of the, the flowers, is this low spreading canopy really creates an entrance um, to, the, to the envious of, I suppose. And when we built the new extensions to the turnstiles in the coffee area and the toilets, this tree was, um, I suppose, it was the bane of the builder's life, but we, we had to protect it. Cherry trees hate any interference with their roots compaction any digging so we created a, a boundary around it where machinery and, and people were unable to go which uh, complicated the building project somewhat but I was down here regularly checking that nobody was interfering with, with my my lovely cherry tree and uh, it, it certainly looked at the moment like it's it's certainly going from strength to strength 
One of the other things you'll notice is the, the spring bulbs right through the estate are looking spectacular. You can see behind me some of the hyacinths. And down as we walk along, you'll see um, the tulips. We've started experimenting with using a lot of tulips in bedding schemes. And they, they really are, they give a wow factor. So I'm gonna walk you down now. We're gonna to head towards the lower arboretum, over the bridge, over the river, and get the first view of the castle, really. Um, so we'll head down anyway. Paul's going to do his best to keep the filming um, going. Um, I think we're doing better than the last run anyway, so. Another, another feature we have is uh, the, the Cherry Avenue, which you'll see coming round the bend here across the river. And this is a double-sided avenue that runs right on our approach up to the castle on the path. And it's planted with uh, Prunus Yukon and Prunus Taihaku. These are both coming into flower now. Again, it's just starting to, to get going. And over the next few years, they're going to spread out and branch out further in this kind of canopy to create what will eventually be a tunnel right up to the castle, which is going to be spectacular. Hey, look, it already is spectacular. And um, there's the castle, so uh, we've ticked that box now, you've seen it. But it is, you know, it's what really brings in most of our visitors. In a normal year, we will be approaching half a million visitors. So for us, this is quite uh, an unusual situation to be in. Um, and it certainly does make you stop and think. But look, I'm just happy to try and bring you, bring you into the gardens a little bit. I just want to show you this primula down here. This is one of the best ones to be planting in the gardens. Um, this is, it's an Irish cultivar called Primula June Blake. And you can see it bulks up really well. And uh, it also is, is hardy, so it will put up with our frost, unlike some of the garden centre primulas you buy that will melt in the first sign of any frost. So we're gonna head across the bridge now um, into the lower arboretum. And what I want to do is bring you and show you our sign with the map of the whole gardens and talk you through some of the areas. The lower arboretum um, and the upper arboretums, some of the trees date back up to 300 years and these would have been parkland planting that would have been dotted through um, really grazed fields um, with the sheep and the cattle. But over the years we've added more and more planting and in the 19, late 70s, early 80s a man called Harold Hillier got involved. And Harold Hillier had a, an English nursery and he was a plant collector and a plant hunter. Great plants man, but Hillier's nursery still runs today. But Harold was the, the real plantsman and the collector. And he helped to lay out some of the garden areas, the arboretums, and he supplied a lot of the trees. And the current owner, Sir Charles, and his brothers were responsible for planting quite a lot of these trees which is great because it means that there's the personal connection, which is always brilliant. And um, we're very fortunate to have an owner like Sir Charles and um, his um, wife Caroline, who really are very keen on the gardens and want to develop and leave a legacy. And it's, it's really somebody like that being in charge that enables us to, to do this. It could be very different, um, but fortunately we have we have a great team of people and um, I think really into, over the next few years we're really, going to see our last 10 years work really come into its own now. We're still planting, there's a lot of new trees going in which as I show you different areas of the grounds and the gardens I'll talk about. Um, but it's exciting to see so much of our work starting to actually flourish and grow. So this is a map of the estate. And you can see, there's the UR here. So we've just crossed the bridge over the river. And this is the main entrance area where we came in. And um, we're looking across the lower arboretum towards the castle. Most runs of our visitors, obviously, they come in the entrance up to the castle and they do the first job, which is kissing the stone. They then spread out around. We have the, the stable yard area where we have the cafe, the gift shop and then beyond that, it stretches out. We have the Blarney House, 
which is open for tours in the summer months. And then the gardens, right through to the lake area. You see the blue line follows the lake walk. This is around an hour at a short stroll or 45 minutes if you're, if you're rushing it. But um, what I really want to emphasize is the size and the scope that we have. Certainly there's plenty of opportunity for social distancing around here. Um, but I'll talk you through some of the areas quickly and some of the areas I'd like to cover in the next few weeks. We'd appreciate if you want to throw up some suggestions as well as to favorite areas or things you'd like me to talk about. So the oldest areas of the gardens date from the 1750s and this is here, this is the Rock Close. And really at the time of um, the mansion being built on the side of the castle by the Jeffreys family, they developed these, these gardens. And this is a very, um, I suppose historically, this was a, a fanciful garden with a lot of uh, structures built up onto the limestone outcrops um, as follies. And a folly suggests or, um, something otherworldly or tells a story. And our rock close is, uh, I suppose the, the description, something out of Lord of the Rings or, or the Chronicles of Narnia would not be inaccurate because it really is otherworldly. And we have features like the Wishing Steps, which is a tunnel through a tunnel of rock that comes out into a little clearing under an ancient yew tree, which is said to be over 600 years old. The yew tree is currently the Irish tree of the year and um, went on to be in the finals for the European tree of the year. But underneath the yew tree, there's a cave and the cave is the witch's kitchen again built in the 1750s and it's said to be the home of the Blarney Witch. So this area is very popular with children and adults alike and it's the mystery and the myths that it encompasses um, that stands in good stead and have really come through the centuries very well. Um, below here we have the dolmen at the base of the wishing steps and then you cross the river into a newer garden area which was developed in the last three or four years which is built around um, an, a new Neolithic stone circle. There's not many gardens you get away with building a Neolithic stone circle as, as a feature, but in Blarney we do. Um, it's really a nod to the Upper Rock Close, the Druids, the Witches, the Wizards and the Dolmens, and it sits very well in the landscape. And what we've done is we've created beds around this whole area of upright large grass species planted in drifts and soft colourful perennials and so you get a lot of movement and softness against the harshness of the rocks. It's I think one of my favourite garden areas now. And then coming back across along by the castle banks we have the jungle area, the tropical borders and again a lot of rare and unusual plants from other parts of the world and we bring those out for the summer, put them back in for the winter and it does give that whole jungle tropical feel. Beyond that, past the cafe and up, we go into the Upper Arboretum, which is another large collection of tree species from all over the world. But running alongside it, we have our Belgian beds. The Belgian beds are called such because the original plants came from Belgium, but they're a collection of azaleas and rhododendrons, and they're just starting to flower now, but come April and early May, they'll just be an absolute blankets of color through here, and they'll steal the show at that time of year. If you were to turn right at the end of the Belgian beds, we run down our Himalayan Valley, which is another collection of rare and unusual. I've been traveling with various colleagues in, uh, in Sikkim, in the Himalayas, and then into Vietnam. And we've also collected a lot of rare and unusual species from other gardens. And really, this is a collection of experimental plants to some degree from all over the world and looking at how they perform, what they do, and it's a bit of a plantsman's garden, um, but the ceiling show at the moment next to number 24 is a 100 year old Rhododendron Arboreum tree, which is this variety's Cornish red, and it's just a sea of red flower at the moment. Beyond that, you go through, we can oversee our walled garden where we do our fruit and vegetable production as well as the growing on of all of uh, uh, the tree and shrub species that we collect for the gardens. We also have our bee observation area, which looks out over our orchard. And then beyond here, looping back around, we have our Vietnamese garden, our fern garden area, and then back returning towards the castle. There's some of our newer garden area is the carnivorous courtyard, which we've just opened. Um, 
and it's a collection of carnivorous plants plus others should be very interesting for the children and that runs through then into the poison garden which is probably one of our most popular gardens with tourists um, I suppose the shock factor and uh, the content in itself is very interesting um, but there's so much more to see as well um, I'm not going to keep you too much longer because we've been going a good while now but uh, I want to kind of show you the castle again we will visit other areas I'm going to do an introduction to the, the wildlife and biodiversity of the estate as well on the other day we have got all the items of wildlife on the estate we are actually right the wildlife estate which is another thing that is a, another street to our forward I say but I want to kind of finish with a view of the castle and a little walk up the Cherry Avenue We've kind of gone for a natural look with the bulb planting over the last two or three years as well with lots of different daffodil and narcissus species going in and they're gradually starting to naturalize now and you can see the effect as, as the cherries come into flower we also have the, the narcissus flowering underneath to create like a, a double blanket I suppose. So I'm going to stop talking now and thank you very much for joining us today and I'd really appreciate your feedback on to how you think it's gone um, and anybody that wants to ask any questions we'll do our best to answer and uh, different areas of the gardens perhaps that you'd like us to cover in the coming weeks um, but we'll probably end on this shot which is the, a popular one with the tourists it goes two ways normally they take the shot to frame the castle or they stick their head through it. So uh, <laughs> thanks very much for joining us today and um, we'll uh, schedule one for next week and decide where to go from here. Thanks again guys. <laughs>